Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our first uh, parent leadership webinar of the 2014-2015 school year. This webinar is called Making the Case for School Wellness and is brought to you by Action for Healthy Kids. Today we are joined by three presenters, uh, the first of which is Carol Mueller, who is our Regional Field Manager for Colorado. Carol is a parent of two teenagers, and she manages our parent engagement initiatives here at Action for Healthy Kids. After you hear from Carol, you're going to hear from Kelly Langston, who is our state coordinator in North Carolina. She has four kids, and she has been volunteering in their schools for 13 years, and she recently got her Master's of Public Health and joined our Action for Healthy Kids team. Also joining us a little bit later in the broadcast is uh, Deirdre Sullivan, and Carol's going to introduce more about her at that time, but she's a parent educator from our Colorado team. My name is Hannah Laughlin. I'm the Regional Field Manager for the Midwest and the Northwest here at Action for Healthy Kids. And I'm going to be um, uh, addressing questions that you may have throughout the broadcast. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those logistics now. So we are using a technology today called GoToWebinar that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, once you're linked into the call, you'll see a control panel that's usually on the right side of your screen. And you can use that um, to enter any questions that you have there in the dialog box. You can also um, either call in via telephone or speakers to listen to the presentation. But do know that everyone is muted that's on the call to avoid static and background interference. So because of that, like I just said, uh, there is a dialog box kind of at the bottom of your control panel on the right. And this is where you can type questions. Um, as we're going along throughout the uh, presentation, we'll answer them um, both by replying in that same dialog box and then also um, address them verbally at the end of the presentation. You should know that this webinar, webinar is being recorded today and links to the recording and the handouts that are uh, referenced throughout the call will be sent to you uh, two days after the webinar. So um, keep a lookout for that in the next couple of days. So I'm now uh, going to turn it over to Carol Mueller, who is going to kick us off. Thanks very much, Hannah, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're so glad you could take the time today to join us. And for those of you, uh, if this is your first experience with Action for Healthy Kids, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background on who we are. We are a national nonprofit, and we fight childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. We are made up of uh, moms and dads, teachers, students, school and community leaders, and uh, many school wellness experts who have all banded together to create healthier learning environments for our kids. We really feel that everyone has a role to play in ending the nation's childhood obesity epidemic. And we have really lots of great programs, tools, and resources that help to make that possible. So we were founded in 2002 by former Surgeon General David Thatcher. And uh, today we have more than 80,000 members. Uh, we also partner with professional associations, government agencies, and uh, corporations and businesses at the national and local level. So this presentation is part of the Action for Healthy Kids Leadership Series, Parent Leadership Series. Uh, we really feel that parents play such a critical role in creating healthy school communities. And we found uh, that we, the school communities that we work with that have strong parent advocates are really more effective at creating uh, the kinds of changes which are sustainable and permanent. And, and so we developed this series to provide parents and school wellness advocates with the tools and knowledge they need to make uh, their efforts a success. So on the screen, you can see the topics that are covered in the entire series. We've divided those uh, topics into six separate webinars, which we present live throughout the year. And then we also have the latest ones archived for you to view later. As Hannah already mentioned, we're recording it. So um, you can see it again and uh, share it with other people in your community. So today we're focusing on the first topic, making the case for school wellness. Now, uh, today's webinar is going to cover why it's important to make the case to your community before you get started. 
Uh, we're going to talk about how to share information about childhood obesity and the learning connection. Uh, we'll cover some common school customs and how they can send conflicting messages. And then we will talk about sharing best practices, what to share and how to share them. And then finally, we will end up uh, answering some common questions that, and concerns that come up. And uh, we'll get some help there from uh, Deirdre, our parent expert. And I'll turn it over to Kelly now. Thanks, Carol. Hi, everyone. So making a case for school wellness is an essential first step towards creating a healthier school culture. As a health advocate promoting wellness activities, it's important that you know how to convey why these efforts are important and necessary. The why is what will get your school community behind you and what will build support for everything that comes next. You have to sell them on the why before you can get into the what or the how. I think people are more passionate about a cause when they are motivated by purpose. Okay, so you may be asking, why schools? Have you ever heard a parent, a teacher, or a principal say something like, schools are supposed to teach kids about reading, writing, or math, or this is not the time or place to teach them healthy habits. It's not our job. So as a health advocate, we have to convince them that health should be an essential part of every school. And here's why. Schools reach most children and adolescents in a community. And school policies, programs, and practices reinforce the behaviors they are learning. Schools provide opportunities to practice these healthy behaviors. Kids spend around 1,200 hours per year in school. That's a lot. Teachers and administrators and school staff are key role models. So are parent volunteers in a school. Curriculum standards for health usually include nutrition and physical education. They should in our practices and climate reflect those standards rather than conflict with them. The bottom line is that schools show kids what we value and what is important in our community. Most importantly, healthy kids do learn better. For that reason alone, schools should be addressing the issue and providing the healthiest environment possible. We'll talk more about the learning connection shortly. But first, let's take a look at obesity in America. Look at this quote from two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Being overweight or obese has become the leading medical reason recruits are rejected for military service. Hmm. Most people know that the U.S. is suffering from an obesity crisis, but they don't necessarily understand how serious it is. They don't often know how it relates to their personal lives or to the school community. They may not understand all of the different ways that they may be contributing to the crisis or the different ways they can help to solve it. So as wellness advocates, it is our job to make these connections for them, to create a sense of urgency about this national crisis. And one visual and striking tool is a series of slides from the Centers for Disease Control that shows the increase in obesity in the U.S. since 1985. Many of you may have seen these. We like to show them as a reminder of how much history is behind us and therefore how much work is still ahead of us. The states will change colors as their obesity rate increases. So you'll see when a brand new color appears, it means that we had to add or there had to be a higher percentage range added to accommodate that growing data. It's pretty scary to watch. And you can see the new colors being added. Colorado is holding out. <laughs> and there you go. There's not a blue state left. Colorado did hold, up, hold, hold out for a long time. But then um, now it's the second growing, fastest growing childhood obesity rate in the nation. So Colorado's children went from fourth leanest to 23rd leanest in just under three years. That's a little scary. But there is some good news reported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Trust for American Health. After decades of rising obesity rates among adults, the pace of increase is beginning to slow, but rates remain high. Their latest report, the State of Obesity 2014, 
reveals that adult obesity rates increased in six states in the past year and remained high overall. The 20 states have rates at or above 30 percent. 43 states have rates of at least 25 percent, and every state is above 20 percent. So we need to educate parents and school staff about negative impacts of unhealthy school practices, inadequate school wellness policies, and the consequences of inaction. Not only will this give you the buy-in and support you need to move your initiatives forward, it will also give them confidence to speak up. Concern for their children's future can often motivate parents and others to act. So uh, it really is a good idea to have several statistics ready. And when you're sharing data, you, you want to share them in a compelling yet sensitive way. You don't want to overwhelm people with too much data. And you, you want to pick some of the, the most memorable and striking and really easily understandable facts, uh, like some of the ones you see there on the slide. You wouldn't necessarily want to give all of these, but these are good examples of the types of things that you could share with people. Um, one out of three American children are overweight or obese, and 30 to 40 percent of them eat fast food on any given day. Uh, kids spend more than seven and a half hours a day in front of a screen for non-school purposes. I read that one over and over again and am just kind of shocked by it every single time. Uh, kids view more than, more than 40,000 commercials on TV each year, and 87 percent of the food and beverages they see on TV are for unhealthy foods. And only one in three are physically active every day, yet only six states require physical education in every grade K through 12. So uh, the CDC, the Data Resource Center, and the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition are great sources of childhood obesity data like these, as well as our website at Action for Healthy Kids, uh, where you can find that great infographic on the left side of the screen. I know it's too small for you to read, but visit our website and take a look at that. That is uh, an infographic from the Institute of Medicine uh, that really uh, shows childhood obesity uh, pretty well. And then if you have local statistics from your state or your school or district, like the ones we shared from Colorado earlier, that is even better. Uh, you can check your state health department. Uh, the Annie E. Casey Kids Count Data Center uh, also provides data at uh, local and state levels. Um, I, I believe in Colorado that the Kids Count report that they put out has a lot of information available by county. And uh, that Kids Count, is the data is really related to the educational, social, economic, and physical well-being of kids. So definitely a good thing to check out. So then, along with obesity information, you'll want to uh, create a sense of urgency by making that connection between health and academic achievement. And this is really, really important. We can't stress it enough, particularly because, as we said, this is what school's mission is. So it's, uh, it's what's very likely to get them on board when they really get this connection. So let your school community know that increased physical activity and improved nutrition have been shown in study after study to increase student achievement. Studies have shown that undernourished kids tend to have low energy. They're often irritable, and they have difficulty concentrating. They also score lower on vocabulary, reading comprehension, and arithmetic tests. Um, I, you can advance the slide, Hannah. I don't know if it, there we go. And actually, to the next one, too. So uh, this shows a study of 5,000 children in the Journal of School Health. Uh, and it shows that it's not just about whether or not you're eating. It also is definitely about what you eat. Uh, this study found a significant association between diet quality and academic performance. And then what about breakfast? How many kids eat a healthy breakfast before school starts? Um, so many kids don't eat breakfast at all. And, and if they're hungry, we all know that they're not going into their classes ready to learn. There's a growing body of research that shows Skipping breakfast really does hurt kids' overall cognitive performance. And students who eat school breakfast have been shown, on average, to attend one and a half more days of school per year and score 17 and a half percent higher on standardized math tests. We Kelly. Also know that, sure, thank you. We also know increased physical activity is also related to school performance. So kids who get regular physical activity experience improvements in their fitness levels and brain function. When kids move more, they are better positioned to succeed in the classroom. Studies like the one listed on this slide 
show that increased physical activity leads to improved mathematics, reading, and writing test scores. That's pretty exciting. Overweight kids miss school four times as much as normal weight kids due to illness and social concerns. Teachers, office staff, and school nurses can certainly relate to this. If kids are in school, they can't learn. So the Learning Connection is a great resource from Action for Healthy Kids to help you make the connection between physical activity, healthy eating, and learning. It's an easy to read special report that summarizes the most recent research proving that healthy kids are better learners. It's a great resource to use with administrators who are so often data driven. Many of the facts we've shared today are from this report. And uh, just as important as sharing these kinds of facts, you want to try to make a link to people's personal lives. Uh, if you're in the right setting, um, you can ask them questions to get them engaged. Do they know anybody who has a chronic disease? Uh, do they know somebody who's always struggling with their weight? Uh, so many people who get involved with health and wellness in schools do so because they have seen the consequences of living an unhealthy lifestyle play out with somebody in their own family. And so when you engage them by asking questions like this, you really are encouraging them to put a face on the information you're providing, and, and that really does make it more meaningful to them. So encourage them to share their stories if you're in an appropriate setting and if they're comfortable doing so. And when you're talking to school staff, be sure to put the issues into a school context. Uh, for example, how many students visit the nurse's office or miss school because they're sick? Now, how many kids can't run around in PE or at recess because they're not fit? And, and the breakfast question again, how many kids aren't eating breakfast before school starts and how is that impacting their focus in your classroom? So for all of these audiences, be sure to connect your message with daily practices taking place at your school. Is your school sending conflicting messages about health and about what you guys value? And we've got some great examples uh, you can use. And, and let's start with rewards. Uh, rewards happen at many levels across the school. Uh, does your school reward students in a healthy way with certificates and small toys or uh, my personal favorite, uh, re extra recess time? You know, or are you using fast food coupons, popsicles, candy, and that type of thing? So uh, the rewards you know, in the classroom, school-wide initiatives, and even for PTA-sponsored activities, rewards are used for all of these types of things. But experts, they recommend non-food rewards as a best practice. Uh, whenever you provide food uh, based on performance or based on specific behaviors that our kids are doing, it really teaches children to eat when they're not hungry. And, um, and that's a lifestyle thing that they're learning that may stick with them forever and, and therefore a big factor in our growing obesity epidemic. Uh, the next slide is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this was in my son's kindergarten. Uh, fitness winners are rewarded with a donut party. Uh, so what kind of message are these young athletes receiving? And then we have an excellent quote from uh, Marlene Schwartz at Yale's Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. Uh, regarding food rewards and the confusing messages that they send. Uh, she says, rewarding kids with unhealthy foods in school is like teaching them a lesson on the importance of not smoking and then handing out ashtrays and lighters to the kids who did the best job, job listening. Um, I, I love that quote. And it's, you know, we would never think of doing that with uh, cigarettes, of course. And then, uh, oh, come on, it's just a mint. Uh, that's another thing that we often hear. Who hasn't heard a comment like that or even made a comment like that? So when you hear something like that, uh, you know, when you're talking to, to uh, school people about giving out candy as rewards, it's a really good opportunity to use a visual aid. You can show your audience what happens when a child receives just one mint per day from a teacher, a friend, or another adult. And over the course of the school year, that adds up to over three cups of additional sugar and 3,600 extra calories. So take it, hold up a mint, hold up a bag of sugar with three cups in it, and uh, point out that it's never just one mint a day. Now, kids are getting candy everywhere they go. Uh, we, we all love giving kids treats, but we don't really think about or understand how quickly it can add up. And so that bag of sugar will help to demonstrate your point. So let's talk about celebrations. Now, in class, students learn about nutrition, healthy eating, and the importance of moderation. 
But then we go to some classrooms and students uh, are eating birthday treats over 25 times each year. And that's in addition to their holiday parties. A recent study that was published in the Journal of Nutrition, Education, and Behavior revealed that kids can eat as many as one-third of all the calories they need in a day at a typical half-hour birthday party. Wow. Take a look at this calendar. Your parent group's message about what is important can also be rather confusing. So here's a typical calendar of parent-led events and activities. And you can see there's a healthy fun run, but it's followed by a fundraiser at a fast food restaurant. And take a look at the price for the, turn -off, the TV turnoff week. It's a high-calorie pancake party. Parent groups play a large role in choosing and running fundraisers, which support great things like sports and music, technology, and the arts. And yet, what do they promote? So let's take a look at some of these examples. Your fundraisers can promote healthy living or the not so healthy living. You've got restaurant nights promoting fast food, sales of cookie dough, or candy bars. But take a look at the other things on this slide. You can see we've got some fruit sales, some seed packets, some active fundraisers. These things might better align with what we're trying to teach our children. How about our family events? So here are some common things that we see often. School carnivals, donuts with dad, muffins with mom, and the list goes on and on. We've talked a lot about nutrition. So what about physical activity? In the classroom, we learn that physical activity is critical to lead a long and healthy life. Yet often recess time is shrinking in most schools to make room for more academics or for students to make up homework or tests. Recess is also taken away for disciplinary purposes when kids act up. These kids may be the very ones who can't sit still in class and they need recess the most and oftentimes just getting outside and getting the wiggles out helps them come back and regain their focus and their readiness to sit down and learn. Less than 10% of our public schools offered daily PE, whereas it used to be routine and standard. So your role as a wellness advocate is to point out the contrast to your audience. The point is not to lay blame, because that won't get us anywhere, but to show how confusing all of these messages are for our children. How will children really know what we value when we say one thing and then do another? So, when your audience sees these conflicting messages, they will be more likely to see their part in both the problem but also in the solution. Carol? Okay, so uh, let's talk about solutions. What is the solution? And um, I just want to emphasize again, Kelly already uh, said this, but it's so important uh, to be positive. Um, it's important to focus much of your discussion around the solutions. When you're negative or confrontational, it's not going to get you nearly as far as asking your, for your audience's help and, and really offering them a way to be a part of the solution. Uh, we feel that sharing best practices that are out there is, is a great way to present your solutions. Uh, tell your audience what's happening with school wellness policies and practices in your own district. Uh, share best practices from other districts so that they can place your projects and initiatives and concerns in the proper context. Uh, you know, things like what your district is working on in terms of health. Have there been healthy changes to the lunch menus or, or are there changes in the works? Is the wellness policy being used? Has it been updated recently? Uh, do you have a district wellness committee or health advisory council that meets regularly and takes action? Not everybody knows about these things. Sometimes uh, we think that, you know, it's common knowledge, but, but oftentimes it's not. So, um, you know, are, is the wellness committee at the district level making their efforts and results public to help, help promote their work? So let's talk about what the healthiest schools are doing in terms of nutrition and physical activity and uh, go over some of these recommended best practices that then you can share. Uh, first off, making healthy options standard whenever foods are shared. Uh, parties, fundraisers, school events, celebrations in and out of the classroom. Uh, this can also include snack time, school stores, vending machines, and athletic events. 
And you, you want to choose fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat, fat-free dairy products whenever possible. You know, how about a, a watermelon social instead of an ice cream social? Uh, or how about a yogurt and fruit bar? Uh, water is especially important. Kids need lots of water, and too often sugary drinks are their primary source. Um, talk to your school community about, about um, these types of things. And then food doesn't have to be the primary focus or even included in every event. Um, host active events, which promote physical activity along with music, art, and games. How about an active fundraiser like the Hippie Hopathon pictured on the slide uh, there from an elementary school in Ohio? Uh, we often see that when we do start to, to have these events that are more active and are not focused on food, and sometimes we don't even include food, that the kids don't really miss it as much as the parents think that they're going to. Uh, so it, it's a very interesting transition to make. And then uh, getting back to rewards, whether you're a teacher, a parent, administrator, um, provide students with those non-food rewards that we talked about for good behavior and performance. Special privileges like the extra recess uh, and trinkets both fit the bill there. And then getting uh, to, oh, Kelly, this is you. Go ahead. Thank you. So work with your school nutrition department to support the new healthy meals that are being provided. Learn about how school meal programs work and what they can do to support, what you can do to support the school meal improvement and be a resource to your food service staff. You can increase opportunities for nutrition education. Supplement what is being taught in the classroom through school gardens, healthy snack programs, taste tests, or healthy vending in school stores. How about offering health tips in your school newsletter? That's an easy thing to do. Or bring in special workshops for students and families. And you can help increase opportunities for physical activity throughout the day and beyond the school day. Think about classroom activity breaks, more recess, or even better quality recess, before and after school programs. How about a walk to school or bike to school program? And this is really important. To build support for these healthy practices and ensure that they will continue, urge school leaders to write them into school policies and school guidelines. Incorporate them into school improvement plans to stay on track and keep attention focused on health as a priority. This holds everyone accountable. A great way to share best practices is by using success stories. Again, as Carol mentioned, focusing on the positive. Find out what types of programs and initiatives have been successful in your area. First, look, look for the relevant local success stories. If a school knows that another school has been successful, it will be easier to get them on board. And we all know that there's competition between schools and even districts, so use it to your advantage. If you're making the case to parents, show successful parent-led or PTA initiatives. If you're making the case to teachers and administrators, share success stories that other teachers or administrators have implemented. And remember to point out the impact in the terms that will resonate with that particular audience. So for an example, uh, the school across the town started a breakfast in the classroom program. And as a result, students are more focused, attendance has increased, parties have decreased, and visits to the nurse's office have declined. Those are all things the principal is going to want to hear. And here's an example you can use from our website. So an elementary school in Florida implemented Game On. It's our free wellness program for K-12 schools. You can find it on our website. They had lots of different activities at one point, and they did a vegetable taste test with their fourth grade students. The teachers were amazed because after the taste test, the students unanimously chose to have vegetables rather than cookies, candy, and chips at their holiday party. I think that's fabulous. So in addition to changing the kids' attitudes and preferences about food, the school also experienced dramatic increases in their test scores after promoting healthy eating and physical activity. So it's a win-win for everyone. The Learning Connection also has some great resources and um, some great success stories that you can use. And there are many more that you can pull from from our website. So take a look at, at our website. Great. Thank you, Kelly. So now, after all of this information, and you take it, and you, you make your case at your school, and then um, ideally, everybody at your school is in perfect agreement, right? Well, of course, that is how we hope it will go for you. 
but most likely, uh, most likely there will be questions and there will be concerns about what you want to do. So we have put together a list of common questions and concerns that we've heard from many parents and school leaders working in the field over the past 10 years. And um, this is where we're going to bring in our parent expert, Deirdre Sullivan, our parent educator, and we're going to have her weigh in. Now, Deirdre is, uh, has been a health educator and parent advocate for healthy schools in the Poudre School District in northern Colorado for over seven years. And I am not going to tell you about everything she's accomplished, because I think hopefully she'll share some of that as she's answering these questions. But uh, we're so glad to hit, have you here, Deirdre, and we're going to put you on the spot and ask you a bunch of questions. Sounds good. It's great to be here. So uh, let's start with this first one on the screen. Have you ever heard anybody uh, say at a school, we just can't get to this. We're too busy. How do we fit wellness projects in? Uh, I don't think I've heard anyone. I think I've heard about everyone. So <laughs> yes, it's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of times school leaders agree that wellness is important, but they say they don't have time or the resources to commit to it. Um, you know, I think by offering parent support in the part of a, as a wellness committee um, or as volunteers or as organizing PTA events that are wellness oriented. I think it's important to let them know that parents are willing to have help and we're not really asking for a large time commitment on their part, just really support um, to start instigating some uh, health and wellness activities. And the payoff is totally worth it. Okay, so how about this one? Shouldn't we be focusing on academics? How would you respond? Well, you touched on this a little bit earlier with some of the data that you shared. And um, I think it's important to validate that with the increasing academic pressures and priorities that teachers and administrators are, have reason to be worried, um, you know, and, and that wellness efforts might take time from academics, that, you know, to validate that. But I think there's a lot of things we can do to let them know that there are a lot, plenty of ways to integrate physical activity, nutrition education, and things like that into the standard curriculum or the, the academic day. Um, and again, that data piece is really important about um, the link between health and learning. And I think it's important to acknowledge that we know how much is on their plates and that these two things go hand in hand. And there's a... Um there's a good example there on the screen uh, from Gunnison, Colorado. They won a, a Colorado State level Healthy, Healthy School Champion Award in 2012, uh, which is um, a, a great incentive and recognition that um, Colorado has put in place. And the school describes their program, uh, their wellness program, as a high-functioning, best practices-driven, creative, effective, and fun-coordinated school health program. And they really do believe, as you can see from that quote there on the slide, they really, they really feel that their increases in test scores and attendance have a strong connection to that wellness program. So stories and examples like that are really great to share when you come across that question, too. And Carol, I think it's really important as parents that we demonstrate our willingness to understand the academic um, issues in schools. And so a lot of times I recommend to parents just to spend some time you know, getting on your school accountability committee or whatever the, the structure is to learn. And, and even at the district level, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, to understand the standards that they're responsible for teaching and testing and then figure out how you can organically weave health and wellness in so that you, tr you demonstrate a true partnership um, for both academics and health. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and not, not just to understand all of those connections, but also to give, uh, to gain credibility, I think, right. um, within your school community, too. All right, so how about this one, a number three? It's not the school's job to teach healthy habits. Isn't that the parent's job? <laughs> yes, we hear that one a lot. I think it's important to remind them that it's the school's job to maximize student performance and go back to those studies about healthy habits and their link to academic success. You know, um, I think it's important to remind schools that we don't expect them to solve the obesity crisis alone. There's a lot of us at work to try to help kids be fit and healthy, physicians, parents, the community. But schools are really critical because of the time that they have kids and the bar that they set in terms of what is, in terms of what is right and acceptable. 
um, I had an example when my daughter was in fifth grade where she was getting Mountain Dews for getting an A on a math test and a sucker thrown at her every time she answered a question right and a root beer party for turning in her homework folder and yada, yada, yada. You guys can all probably relate. And I just sent a really thought out diplomatic email to the teacher with this 40,000 foot perspective of, you know, as a parent who's concerned about childhood obesity and the link between health and learning, I just want you to see this from my vantage point. And the teacher was so appreciative and said, I've been teaching for 18 years and we've always done it this way and I've never really thought about how little kids are moving now and how this is, so thank you. So I think it's important just to point out, um, you know, in the last line of the email from me was, I want to be your partner in education and I really am asking you to be my partner in health for my child. And so it was a great dialogue. Oh, I love that. That's, I love that, your partner in health. Okay, yeah. how about um, tradition? We don't want to break with our school's traditions. Uh, for example, you know, we've always had an ice cream social to reward our star athletes uh, or for a family event, or we've always had a cookie dough fundraiser for the past 20 years. Uh, yes, well, if schools' traditions have had a negative impact on performance, academic performance and student health, and are teaching the kids unhealthy habits, it's time to create some new traditions. Um, you know, when the school started having ice cream parties 20 years ago, chances are kids had a lot more opportunities to burn off those calories. They probably rode their bike home or walked. They didn't go home and have an iPad um, that they could sit on for hours on end. So not only are today's kids overfed and undernourished, a lot of, most of them are getting much less than the recommended 60 minutes of moderate to physical, vigorous physical activity. We've added the calories and taken away the exercise, and that's really a recipe for an epidemic. And back to that email that I shared, it was painting that picture, the whole calories in, calories out. Your Mountain Dew is not going to make my child obese, but all of these factors together are important. And so as a school community, it's time to look at our traditions and say, are they helping kids or are they hurting kids? Okay, and this one, which is a big one that I've heard over and over again. Uh, kids like what we're serving them now. We don't want that to change. <laughs> well, kids like a lot of things we don't offer them because of the negative consequences. I mean, if it was up to them, they'd probably ride their bikes without helmets. They'd stay home from school. You know, think about things like tobacco and beer. Um, sometimes it's hard to remember that kids aren't in charge for a reason that we are. Uh, it takes time and patience and a lot of attempts serving the same new foods to change their preferences, but it's really worth it. Um, we have to be the adults in this and demonstrate our commitment to doing what's right for kids. So um, I think that's really important. That's well said. And what if parents are concerned that we are removing foods that are an, an important part of their cultural heritage? Culture change is hard. Um, it takes time and patience. And we're not suggesting any heritage should discard its traditions in every setting all the time. But we do encourage unhealthier foods to be offered on a limited basis and not in the school setting. Um, we're not telling families that they can no longer have cupcakes for birthday parties. We're just suggesting that maybe that's something to be done at home. If foods at school, foods that are shared are healthy at school, parents can be more comfortable at home offering the occasional treats because um, they have control over the timing, the quantity, and the setting and can keep that whole moderation into perspective. I think it's interesting. I, my um, daughter went to a dual language immersion school, which was primarily Hispanic Latino. And we did a lot of work and, and education and research around the Hispanic culture prior to becoming prior to coming in, be coming to America is much healthier than they become when they come to our country. The obesity rates um, among Hispanic Latino families rise after they begin to acculturate and come into our American fast food sugar for everything. So you know, demystifying some of those perceptions that oh well. You know, sugar is a part of that culture. No, that's that happened when they came to to our country. So let's let's reverse that. Uh, plus, I think there uh, certainly are ways to you know prepare things, whether they are you know traditional from your culture or not. There are ways to change recipes and make things a lot healthier. Too, Absolutely. I know I've heard you know stories stories about uh, that, and I don't even know if you've told them. Deirdre, but um, I know I've heard a lot about 
um, healthier versions of, of traditional things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and how about, this is a big one, what about when schools say they can't afford any new initiatives? You know, their budget barely covers what's needed for academics, much less for music and the arts. Um, how do you find room for wellness in that budget? Well, there's no question that around the country budgets are tight and schools don't want any more unfunded mandates. You know, creating a healthy school culture takes time and patience, creativity, some perseverance. For some projects, funding is necessary, but they don't have to be done all at once, and much can be done without any funding at all. You know, changing the way we celebrate birthday parties and reward kids, health promotion, physical activity breaks, recess before lunch, all of those things come with no cost. Um, and, you know, for things that do have a, a price tag, there are frequent grant opportunities out there or community partners to help out. I, um, at one point, approached our dental society about helping offset some of the funds that would be lost by not selling candy anymore. And they were totally willing to step up to the plate and say, we would love to support schools in raising money without selling candy. So thinking about those non-traditional partners in your community that you can go to um, for, for assistance. Oh, great, and I would just um, like to add that if we can get, uh, n no matter what role you play in the school, you know, whether you're in the front office or, you know, a teacher or a parent volunteer, um, getting diff the people in those different roles to use student and community health is, is a filter kind of when you're planning your activities, you know, kind of asking those questions. Do sweets really need to be a part of, of this event? Um, how important is that? You know, can, can we incorporate movement in some way? Uh, becoming a champion for student health and, and looking at it, uh, looking at your activities through this lens, uh, really can um, start to make a difference in your community. And, and really, because good nutrition and physical activity are so important to learning and student performance, as we've discussed, you know, they should have a prominent place at the table when academic initiatives are being considered, whether they're funded or otherwise. And, and once your school community starts to look at things in this fashion, uh, they may be more willing to invest their time and their funding in, into this kind of culture change because they see what, what difference it makes. So Kelly, do and you Carol, have anything to oh, add, too? Yeah, I was just going to mention that um, for whatever reason, based on my experience and, and experience of other parents that I have worked closely with, Food tends to be a more um, personal, I, I want to say controversial, but it shouldn't be, um, over physical activity. And if you, as a parent, if you sense resistance on the part of your administration, your principal, um, you know, others in leadership positions, I, I recommend starting on the physical activity realm and adding something to the school environment. So saying, hey, I'd love to get a morning fitness program started, or hey, I heard about these healthy fundraisers where schools are raising $10,000 with run-a-thons and walk-a-thons, and bringing something, adding something to the school um, of value before you start having those conversations around taking away cupcakes or switching over the snack shack at the middle school level or any of those things. And sometimes you have to spend a couple years priming the pump um, before you can start taking away, so to speak. If you come in as that cupcake crusader saying, no cupcakes at birthdays, you can really set a tone if there isn't already support um, that doesn't always set you up for success. Yeah, that's, a, that's um, good advice, I think. Well, um, Kelly, do you have any, anything to add? Or sure. I was going to just add that um, if your principal is the one that's making any of these arguments or expressing some of these concerns and seems especially stuck on re, uh, retaining their viewpoint, you know, I think we can take that as a sign that if we bring additional parents to the cause, um, they might start um, showing some more willingness to listen. I think, you know, we hear a lot about family and parent engagement, and principals know that that's important. So I think that if principals know that there's a good-sized group of parents that really believe in the importance of this, they might be more likely to give the go-ahead and to really work with you. So really trying to build a consensus and getting a group of parents that share your concerns to have that conversation in a positive and produ productive manner. That's great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, sure. and, and thank you, Deirdre. Um, I hope you stick around for a minute or so, and Hannah will let us know if there's any questions out there for you. And if there aren't any from out there, then I 
would love to hear more about some of the work you've done. But first, I just wanted to um, share a resource that we have with you. It's our Share Healthy Food and Activity presentation. Uh, this really something that should always be a part of your main message whenever you're making the case is how important it is for everybody in different roles within the school to be working together. Parents, teachers, students, school leaders, community members, we really make a lasting impact when we combine our efforts. And uh, the key to providing kids with these consistent messages is to work together. So Hannah, if you can advance the slide, I just want to show that we have a link to uh, this slide so show presentation that you can download and share with your audience. It uses many of the same slides that are in this webinar. Uh, the CDC obesity slides, the conflicting messages, and the best practices. And if you don't want to actually download the slideshow and give it, you can just pull it up on YouTube because we have recorded it in both English and Spanish. And it takes 12 to 15 minutes, depending on the language. And you can just um, use it to challenge your school community and kind of give them an introduction uh, the way we've done here today. And with that, um, Hannah, do, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, we have um, one that's coming. And just a reminder to those of you out there in the audience, if you have any questions, please enter them in the question box now. That would be great. The question um, that we have is, um, if you are a parent and you're looking for kind of another healthy non-food reward option, I know that schools, because of budget cuts, are, are um, in need of some kind of really uh, uh, school-specific supplies like pencils or erasers or um, things like that. So have, do either one of you have experience um, you know, with changing classroom birthday parties to be more focused on kind of those supplies that often teachers um, go out of their own pockets to support? Uh, Dear, do you want that. to take or Kelly? Sure, I'll sure. start and then if Kelly wants to add, does that work? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we, uh, at my kids' schools, we have done birthday boxes where we use PTA funds or um, we've used funds from our wellness fundraisers. I mentioned a little bit um, in my uh, earlier discussion about a fun run that we, I've gotten going now at two different schools. Um, and we earmarked a portion of the proceeds from that PTA event to actually support health and wellness um, classroom activities. So we created birthday boxes with different games and activities that kids can do instead of passing out cupcakes. By and large, um, the kids choose recess over a birthday party um, at my kids' schools. Um, they, the teacher said it takes as much time to pass out 25 cupcakes as it does to go outside and have an extra 10 to 15 minutes of playtime. And nine times out of 10, the kids pick that. So that's a free non-trinkety um, reward, the birthday box, the extra recess. And then I've also heard of schools where they ask the parent to do an all about me on the day I was born, and they read it out loud, and then going around and having the kids say something that they like about the birthday person. So just kind of an affirmation and celebration of you instead of celebration of cupcakes. So those are things that don't cost anything that can easily replace the cupcakes. Those are great yeah. ideas. I was others? just going to add. I do, Carol. I was just going to add that um, in my kids' elementary school, the principal there really, she, as she says, almost died on the hill of school wellness. Um, but she had a group of parents that really were behind her, and it was, as Sergey said, um, a couple-year progress process to make this these changes. And one of the things she did do was tell parents that they couldn't bring the cupcakes to school for child's birthdays parties. And um, she has parents at the beginning of the school year actually sign an agreement that they will not bring anything unhealthy into the school for a classroom celebration or birthday party. And that's one of the, the forms that must come back at the beginning of the year. And she lists healthy snacks that parents can send in for their child's birthday or they can come in and do a physical activity um, session with, with the kids. And honestly, the kids are so excited. And, and I think there were just, it, was, it took a little while to convince some of the parents that really wanted to bring the cupcakes in for their kids when they saw the kids' excitement about the physical activity. Um, and also, they were thrilled to get grapes for a snack. Because I think we, we forget that kids are so, um, 
given the, the junk food so often in our culture that sometimes those kids are craving the healthy foods because they don't see those as often. So that was the experience that I have now as far as giving um, classroom supplies to teachers. We haven't, I, I really haven't seen that as often. Um, they tend to bring that in throughout the school year as a teacher request. So that's a good idea to do that in, for a child's birthday. And at, at my, um, in my children's elementary school, we gave out, well, we did, the, the parent was asked to bring, one of two things, kind of depending on whether parents could afford this or not, but um, parents were asked to either bring in a book to donate to the classroom library, and then the birthday child got to, you know, sit up with the teacher and read it together to the class. And if that doesn't work, if that's not affordable for um, the people at your school, you could also just have the child get to select the book that is already in the classroom library and um, just kind of, you know, make it a special occasion and have them read it. But I love the physical activity, the, you know, the ones that get them moving and more active. Um, I, I think those are really, really great ideas. And uh, we do have, Action for Healthy Kids has tip sheets on all of these best practice areas that we've discussed. Um, go to our website and you can uh, click actionforhealthykids.org slash parent toolkit and you'll find um, our parent leadership series, all these share healthy food and activity uh, tip sheets and uh, lots of other great resources including our Game On program. So definitely encourage you to do that and get um, tons of different ideas for not just for celebrations but fundraising and snacks and recess and all of that. Any other questions, Hannah? We haven't had any come through, Carol, so if you have any that you'd like to share. Well, you know what I thought I would do if I can put Deirdre on the spot here? Um, she has done such great work in her uh, over the past six or seven years, and I just thought maybe she would share a little bit about that. She's achieved success with school-level changes related to fundraising, uh, before and after school programs, and that type of thing. Deirdre, do you mind if I put you on the spot? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've done. No, not at all. Um, so I, um, I mentioned a little bit about the school level things that I have worked on, but I also um, have organized some efforts at the district level. So I worked um, to create a coalition of parents to really advocate for changes to the school meal program, so the breakfast and lunch program. Um, and we, um, we actually made it an election issue in our school board election a few years ago. We had four open seats, and we made health and wellness um, an election issue and really put the candidates on the spot in terms of do you support um, the link between health and academic achievement, and will you support some changes? And so that was um, really successful. And that was a great way to really mobilize the medical community. So we had physicians and, as I mentioned, dentists and other folks in our town who we're passionate about helping the schools be more proactive around health and wellness. Um, and then we, our school district operates on a um, system of policy governance, which means the board has some real high-end go overarching goals, but they really let the, um, the schools and the administration come up with how they're going to meet those goals. And so I worked with a school board member to integrate health and wellness as one of the five overarching goals for our whole school district. And then that requires our superintendent to check in on that and to report back on that um, on a regular basis. So that kind of was a way to um, sustain the efforts from a district perspective. Um, and then the last thing we did was we, um, in 2010, our school district went for a mill levy and we were successful in getting the community to ask that funds for health and wellness be available um, on the mill bond uh, property tax increase to support schools so that we could help with all of the schools that are saying, we just don't have any, enough money for more PE. We don't have enough funds you know, for X, Y, Z. We said, well, gosh, then we only do it for a mill levy every 10 years. We really need to, to make health and wellness one of the um, allocated pots of money from which they can, they can draw. So that's just a couple things, a few things we've done at the district level. That, um, and what was great about the, the board policy was that any policy like that of the board requires the district to have a staff member to oversee it. So it led to the hiring of a full-time, and now they've added some more part-time positions to oversee health and wellness across the district. So 
that was exciting. That's great. Thank you so much, Deirdre. And I think, uh, yeah, a really good example of how, how you don't have to stay within your, within your old school, you know, to make a difference and to be an advocate that there are many different levels you can be working at that hopefully will be filtering down to your school. And I know you've talked, you and I have talked before about uh, getting the medical community involved and just, you know, getting key people uh, who have um, fair or unfair sort of more credibility, you know, mm -hmm. when you're out there talking to the public and how bringing them in can, you know, help you advance a lot farther faster. So, right. Anyway. Yeah, it's a lot harder to argue with a physician about whether childhood obesity is an epidemic. Uh -huh. If you think about if any of you out there have been faced with that uncomfortable argument at a PTO meeting because you're the mom who wants to take away the cotton candy machine at the end of your carnival, and you think, gosh, if only I was wearing a white lab coat and a stethoscope as I sat here and talked about why we really shouldn't have cotton candy at a school event. Um, yeah, that's a really a, a valid point. <laughs> well, great. Well, thanks, Deirdre. And Kelly, thank you, too. Really appreciate both of you. And um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'll turn it back over to Hannah. Thank you, Carol. So if you want to learn more about Action for Healthy Kids and how you can get involved with your school's wellness initiative or our mission or our movement, we encourage you to take the Every Kid Healthy pledge and help us create an 100,000-person movement to make all schools healthier places. It just takes 10 seconds, and once you've signed up, we'll show you ways, both big and small, that you can turn your commitment into action. This concludes our webinar for today, so you will receive a follow-up email from us in two to three business days with the link to the recording and the handouts, as we mentioned earlier. And we do thank you for your time today and hope you have a good day. Thank you.